been a while since we've had both Alice on the organ and Gabe on the piano at the same time. Very nice to, to have that again. Thank you. As we go to prayer, we recognize that there's an awful lot going on. There's an awful lot going on globally, internationally. There's a lot going on in our country, in our neighborhoods. I'm going to guess that there's a lot going on in your family. And there are times there's a lot going on inside of each one of us. And we might often be able to display kind of a calm demeanor. But inside there's some dialogue going. And, and, and I specifically say dialogue, not monologue, because we're we're kind of talking with ourselves and arguing with ourselves at times and questioning ourselves. There's a lot going on. And we wouldn't be able to enumerate all of those things, but we do highlight a few of them. And we, we recognize bold face headlines. Big things. Political. Cultural. Financial. And we recognize that each of us in our own lives have those things that we bold, underline, highlight. And sometimes those also are political, financial. The things that keep us up at night are also the things that get us up in the morning. Some of them might seem to be simple things, but we know that in our lives, whether it's, it's something for the good or for the bad, that even the simple things sometimes are kind of complex. And that perhaps what somebody else might buzz right over, we spend a lot of time with. Some of you are gardeners. Some of you grow only things you can eat. You don't see the sense in growing other things. Some of you say, well, I just want to grow the pretty stuff. Some battle the dandelions. And some pause and look at them and marvel at how useful they are. And what they do for our ecological system. Somebody's going to skip over a dandelion. Somebody's going to obsess over a dandelion. Somebody's going to be yanking it out. And somebody's going to say, let them go, let them go. It's good for the pollinators. I don't know how you treat dandelions. I don't know if they become a headline for you. Or if you pause right over, pass right over them. I don't know the intimate details of your prayer life. The things that you just pour out praise over that perhaps others didn't even notice. Or the things that burden you that you don't even try to explain to somebody else because you know they just wouldn't understand. But I do know this. God who created all things, including the dandelion, who knows about the sparrow and knows about the lily in the field, knows what's going on with you. And he cares. And he hears that prayer. You might not have shared it with anybody else, or you might have been beating that drum for 20 years. We join you in praying to a God who hears, knows, understands, and answers. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done through Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for what you've done for us as a people, what you've done for humanity. What you've done for us as those living in America. What you've done for us as 
those living in our communities and those who are part of this church family. What you've done for our families and for us as individuals, we thank you. And we recognize there's nothing that's too big, there's nothing too small, that you are in all things, you see all things, you know all things, and you understand the things that we don't even begin to comprehend. You know the things that pain us that we will never express to anyone else. You understand our joy at things that bring a smile to our face that others don't even pause to think about. You know our concerns in school, at work, in relationships, in our finances, our concern as we see the news or hear it or read it. And you know the peace we get when sometimes we just have to turn that off and close the page. And you know. You know what's going on. And you hear the prayers from deep within our spirit. And so, Father, we offer all of these things to you today, those things that have been shared aloud and passed on, and those that have been kept quiet, those that we trust to one or two others. And we bring all these things before you and leave them with you, trusting in you, that you will hear our praise and magnify it, you will understand our pain and reduce it. That you will know our dis-ease and ease us. So that we rest in you. Hear, O oh Lord, these are prayers offered in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know if you saw this headline, and if you did, I'm, I'm going to bet that most of you, if you saw this headline, you didn't even pay attention. You didn't read the article. If it was a news report coming through, that, and it would, it would have to depend on where you get your news like this, you tuned it out. But there was a recording studio fire last week. Um, and I, and I, I saw a little graphic. I guess I don't really think about recording studios very often. I, I've never needed, never needed one. And I guess when you kind of see it on a TV show or in a movie, they're, they're really just showing like one production booth and one sound booth. And I kind of think that's it. If you drive by a local place that has a recording studio, you, you kind of... Imagine it as you know, two or four rooms, maybe. Well, apparently, where this recording studio was, was a complex full of recording studios. And because there's multiple recordings going on, multiple productions at the same time, you understand the need for acoustic reduction. Well, you can't have that bleed through into the next studio. So the amount of acoustical material, the, the, the double drywall on the walls, the containing that sound, that when there's a fire, there are all sorts of additional issues. Let alone, I can't imagine what kind of chemicals are released when some of that acoustical material ignites. And it proved deadly. And probably, if you did pay the, 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 did anybody see anything about that? Pay any attention to it? Okay, some, some nods, maybe, 
but you probably didn't read anything about it. But if you did, the headline probably wasn't about the deaths at the studio. Interestingly, what the headline was, was that, and I think her name is Amy, but the oldest daughter of Sharon and Ozzy Osbourne was one of the two survivors. And frankly, if Ozzy Osbourne's daughter wasn't there, if my daughter was there or your daughter was there, probably wouldn't have even been a headline. Interesting to think about what things get our attention. And, and maybe my attention was especially drawn to it in thinking about what must it have been like to be there. And part of that was triggered because I, I was going to say recently, but this week, was reading a story about another record production where a fire broke out. And apparently the producer had locked the door for the recording time. And apparently it was standard practice. I don't understand it. I didn't get a whole lot of detail about why that was. But a fire broke out in the building. And the producer would not let people leave because he wanted one more good take. Literally, the water from the fire suppression was dripping into the room and the plaster was falling off of the ceiling. And he kept on recording and did, did not stop until the firemen with their axes broke through the door he had locked. And I read that, and again, with no other real context to it when I read it, I, I was just amazed by that. And then read that this week, and then saw that headline. And thought about what must that have been like? And what about those who were in that building and didn't know what was going on? I don't know. I, 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 and again, I probably should have read a little more carefully or researched a little more. If you're in a recording studio that's soundproof, and again, I've never been in one. Is there a fire alarm in there for you? If the alarm's going off in the building, do you know it? And what must it be like not being able to escape from that? So some of the things that I was thinking about, again, my, my mind goes to weird places at times. In the Scripture passage we're going to look at here in a moment. We're going to see somebody who was trapped. And maybe, to kind of extend my analogy that's at least going on in my mind, maybe he could hear the alarm, but he couldn't get out. And what must that be like? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that. Panic. Multiple ideas bouncing around in your head and probably no complete thoughts, just chaos. Many of you know that a few years ago we had a fire in our house in the middle of the night with the alarm going off. And what do you do, and when do you do, and what steps do you take? And obviously, all things considered, we did pretty well. But imagine not being able to move when the alarm sounds. Our passage today. John chapter 5, a familiar story, one that perhaps you learned in Sunday school back in the day, or was part of a series for vacation Bible school, but a familiar story nonetheless. John chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, 
Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Now, if you're using the worship packet as we read this, and, and I know you don't have to, but if you're using the worship packet, you'll see that I, I, I added some. This is actually, I, I pulled the footnote from the bottom of the page and inserted it here. And I've tried to make it clear that it was not part of the New International Version. What's interesting, if you read the, the NIV and you don't pay attention to the footnote, it goes verse 3 to verse 5. You've got to get the footnote to find this verse 4. And it actually picks up with some extra for verse 3. So catch this. I'm gonna, and I'm going to kind of read it in the context of the, read the footnote into the context of the passage. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and they waited for the moving of the waters. That's verse 3, part B. Verse 4, from time to time an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Now, I'm going to just give you another aside here. For those of you that are taking part in the current Wednesday night Bible study, we're talking about how we got our Bible. This is one of the kind of things we've been talking about, isn't it? We've been talking about why there are footnotes and why some Bibles might have a verse 4 and some don't. Why you and I probably grew up with that passage. And now it's been moved to a footnote. And if I can add a footnote to it, We would sing today if we had it in our hymnal, but we don't. We would sing, wade in the water. You know that one, right? Wade in the water. God's going to trouble the water. And I don't know. I, I've certainly heard that that was a coded song that in use on the Underground Railroad, the idea that, hey, Escapees, get in the water, disguise your trail, trouble's coming. The song predates that, but I, I understand that at least at some point that may have been used. Kind of sing that, and you're kind of singing for everybody what's going on. Frankly, I think that would be a crazy way to get the message to people in an emergency, is to sing it in a song. I think you'd just say, now, get in the water. I like history. I like answers. I just don't have that one. But that idea of the water gets troubled, and when it does, it's a race. The first one in gets the prize. The first one in gets to be healed. Jesus comes to this place, and our gospel writer gives you some background on what's happening here. And frankly, that footnote helps to explain some of what happens next. Verse 5, one was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Now, I don't know how long he's been there. He, at least I would think he hasn't been there 38 years. I do remember as a child hearing this and thinking 38 years he was there. But maybe it wasn't until he was 30 that somebody got him there. I don't know if he, you know, came in from out of town and has been living on handouts from strangers to support himself so that he could be there at the pool so that when the angel troubled the waters, he could get in. I don't know. 
But I, I've been thinking about this. The alarm is going off and he can't get to help. If he could get down to the pool himself, he might not even need to be there. But he's kind of stuck in the catch-22. If I were a little healthier, I could get to the pool faster. If I was healthy enough to get to the pool, I wouldn't even get to the pool faster. And he needs somebody to get him there. So that kind of sets the stage for us. And I will tell you that I get hung up, and maybe you do, on Jesus asking the question, do you want to get well? I think we have so much room in there to really get messed up. I think it's tempting. And again, I have to be careful with this because maybe it's just what's going on in my mind. It's tempting to see that Jesus is saying, do you want to get well? You have the power. It's about you. I can, I can see moving through this idea that we have kind of labeled prosperity gospel. Well, then if you want it bad enough, if you envision it, if you paint a mental image, if you add it to your dream board, it'll happen. I think it's easy to read that and kind of get stuck in this idea that Jesus is challenging him. Do you want to get well? Why aren't you well? Do you not want it enough? Why aren't you doing better in school? Do you not want it enough? Why aren't you making more money? Don't you want it? Why do you still have that disease? Don't you want it to go away? And I think there's a lot of oh, pop psychology and church theology that tries to teach people if you just want it bad enough, if you just pray without ceasing, it will happen for you. I think what everybody has those things that kind of make you cringe when somebody says it. I hate when they interview somebody after a sporting event. And they say, depending on which side they were on, well, I guess we just wanted it more than they did. Or, well, I guess we just didn't want it enough. I don't think that anybody has ever gone to the Super Bowl and didn't want to win the Super Bowl. And I don't think anybody ever won the Super Bowl based on how much they wanted to win the Super Bowl. If that were the case, maybe one of us could win the Super Bowl. Because we might want it bad enough. And I don't know that anybody was ever healed because they wanted healing bad enough. And so that question bothers me. <laughs> can, I, can I say that? That's something that Jesus said bothers me. And maybe it's not so much that it bothers me, but it scares me. How easily that can be taken in a different direction. So why does Jesus ask this? Do you want to get well? Well, let's be honest. We know there are some folks that complain about their circumstances and want something different, but don't want it enough to try to make a difference. 
Can you see some shade in that question? Some shade of meaning, not like I'm casting shade, throwing shade. If you want to get good grades, but you don't want to study, do you want it? Not to be confused with somebody who studies so hard, but just can't get it. If you want to win a Super Bowl, but you don't want to lift weights, and you don't want to change your diet, and you don't want to go to bed at a decent hour, and you don't want to give up substances that are harming your body, do you, do you want it? And let's be honest, there's some folks that are good at talking about what they want, but have no plan to get there. And there are some folks that have gotten to the point where while they might talk about dreams, they have learned to settle for where they are. And so I wonder when Jesus asked this, was he asking the guy, are you, it's been 38 years, are you, have you given up? I know you're here, but and I know you need somebody to get you to heaven. Have you given up, or, or, or do you do you want this? And I don't think Jesus is asking him so that the guy can prove his willingness, can prove his his desire, can prove that he's got the fire in his belly to do this. To give it, because then I think it moves a little bit into a theology of works. So it's not just about what you want, but what are you willing to work hard enough for? So can you see where I'm in trouble with this question? Because it makes me struggle with where's that line? Because I should want more. I should want better. And I should work for more. But if if I've had this condition for 38 years and I physically cannot get there and I depend on somebody else, does my desire change that? And what does that look like? That question, I kind of really wish it wasn't there. I kind of wish my editor would put that in the footnotes and then I could skip over it. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? And he explained why he can't. I don't get there fast enough. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once. And I love when the Bible throws that kind of stuff in there. At once. Immediately. Not after three consultations and six months of rehabilitation, but immediately. The man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. I don't think that this miracle took place because he wanted it bad enough. And his answer didn't really explain whether he wanted it or not. It actually kind of seems like an excuse. So then why did Jesus ask the question? And I get stuck there a little bit. But maybe Jesus was asking the question. Because he wanted to at least put some of this onto the man himself. Do you want it? And even though he didn't come out and say yes, or more than anything, or of course I want it. Instead he says, I have no one to help me. I can't get in the water. And maybe that was enough for Jesus to say, okay, yes, you, you want it. Again, I can see, again, putting myself in the sandals of Jesus, Jesus is saying, I, I can see beyond your answer that that really is a yes you want healed get up, pick up your mat and walk 
I don't, I don't believe Jesus is telling us, if you want it, you can have it. Because there are a lot of people that have gone through a lot of things that we would find very challenging, that wanted desperately something different, and they did not get it. And so I think if Jesus were saying, if you want it bad enough, you can have it, it would be unfair. So why does he say this? Do you ever struggle with this kind of stuff? Do you ever read it and kind of wrestle with it a little bit? I hope so. I hope so. And I hope it sticks with you this week. And you, you keep coming back to this and try to find where is the truth in there? Where is that center point that I'm not either too far one way or too far the other, that I'm not trying to do it just on because I want it bad enough, or that I'm going to work hard enough and it's got to happen. Because then what that does is we start to question somebody else's faith because they don't have what they want and they've worked for and they didn't get. So it must be something wrong with them. I mean, that's what Jesus has to deal with several times. Hey, hey, so why is this man blind? Is it because he's been blind since birth? So was it his sin or must it have been some of the sin from his parents? We tend to want to find the blame. Well, you know what? If you prayed for that and you didn't get it, you must not have prayed hard enough. You must have had some secret hidden sin that you didn't ask for forgiveness for, so your prayer wouldn't go through. Or you must not really have wanted it enough. Do you want to get well, get up, pick up your mat, and walk? Jesus did not sit with the man until the angel troubled the water and carried him down in so he could be in first. Jesus, who could command angel armies, didn't say, hey, hey guys, why don't you all come down here and stir this up so we can get every one of these people into the water and we get them all healed and sent on their way. Even though this guy knew the protocol. He knew how the game was played. He knew what the system was. Everybody knew. That's why they were there. When Jesus asked, do you want to get well? Yes, I do, but I can't get in the water. Jesus says, you don't need any water. You don't need the water to be stirred up. You don't need a special occasion. Trust me. You need me. Get up and walk. I have a question for you. What if the man did not try to get up? What if he'd said to Jesus, the water hasn't been stirred? What if he said to Jesus, 38 years, I can't get up? Could he walk then? I wonder how many times Jesus has a blessing for us that we say that's not how it works. And we miss the blessing. Because he's told us to do this and we don't do it. Because it makes no sense. Even if we wanted it. That's just not how it's done. Last week I told you that language intrigues me sometimes. And I think my mother and I, I think we had this conversation, oh, I don't know, like two months ago. About the phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I mean, we use that to, to talk about the heroic path that somebody took. The struggle 
And they did it on their own. They pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. That is a ridiculous phrase. Can you pull yourself up by your bootstraps? No. Physically impossible. Now, I don't know if anybody has boots on right now. And if they do, I don't know if they have straps on them. But boots sometimes have a strap so you can help pull them on. Think cowboy boots. Think your work boots that sometimes have a strap you can yank on and pull them on. If I were to come out here and try to pull myself up by my shoelaces, can I do it? No. I mean, I might be able to lift one foot, hold the shoelaces and lift one foot. Can I grab the shoelaces of both shoes and lift myself up? No. It's impossible. I can tug hard enough that I fall over, perhaps. But I can't pull. And actually, when that phrase was first used, it was used to point out the obvious. The original documented use was that he thought he could pull his pull himself over the fence by his own bootstraps. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But it has worked its way into the vernacular to be actually the complete opposite. That somehow, independently, by yourself, you could do this. You, you've probably heard me say before, my father used to talk about if somebody claims to be a self-made man, his thing would be, yeah, and it shows. Um, you don't do it by yourself. It can't happen. If Jesus were to tell the man, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, the man would know it's impossible. And we would understand that. But this man who's been an invalid for 38 years has been there at that pool for who knows how long, that has missed his opportunity time and time again. And Jesus says, get up. He knows. I can't. But he's been with Jesus. We don't know if he had any relationship with Jesus. We don't know if he had heard of Jesus. But he trusted. And he got up. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. What a shame it would have been if Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And he was cured, but he just didn't know it. And he didn't get up. As I was reading this, pick up your mat and walk. The song that was playing in my mind was Walk Like a Man. I know we recently talked about it. I, 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 it escapes me off the top of my head. We recently talked about a Four Seasons song, a Frankie Valley song with that falsetto. It's the one that it starts with that, ooh, wee, oh, wee. And I, I would not even try to attempt it. But when you hear it on the radio, you know exactly what's coming. That Walk Like a Man song. The, the Four Seasons had already had two number one hits. They had um, Sherry, and again, some of you can hear that falsetto, Sherry Baby, and Big Girls Don't Cry. But it really didn't fit their New Jersey tough guy image. So they wanted a song that was about being a man. And so they came up with the song, Walk Like a Man. And, you know, the chord, walk like a man, talk like a man, walk like a man, my son. But did you ever really pay attention to the lyrics? It's a breakup song. The girl's doing him wrong. And he's got to be strong enough to walk away. It says, oh, how you've tried to cut me down to size by telling dirty lies to my friends. But my own father said, give her up, don't bother. The world isn't coming to an end. He said, and then you get into that Frankie Valley falsetto, Walk Like a Man. A little bit of irony in there, that when they want to sound tough, they have Frankie Valley sing 
in a falsetto. Walk like a man, my son. No, man, no woman's worth crawling on the earth, so walk like a man, my son. And it ends with, I, I don't mean maybe, oh, goodbye baby, I don't mean maybe I'm going to get along somehow. Soon you'll be crying on account of all the lying. Oh yeah, just look who's laughing now. I'm going to walk like a man. What if the character in that song, his father said, walk away. And he said, yeah, dad, I know I should, but he doesn't. What if Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And he says, yeah, great advice. Not going to happen. Doesn't work that way. And by the way, it was... The recording that you hear on the radio now, or you maybe bought it as a 45 back in the day, of Walk Like a Man by the Four Seasons that their producer wouldn't let them out of the studio when it was burning down. It actually had a, a quote. The producer later, uh, when the smoke cleared, it was just a good record. And the good records, they're hard to bury. He literally used the phrase, when the smoke cleared, we had a good record. This man can't hear the alarm. Or he hears the alarm, he just can't do anything about it. He's trapped. What was his frustration of it? Every time that the crowd rumbled, the water, the water, and people started rushing in and he couldn't get there. What must he have resigned his fate to be? Until this day, this stranger comes in, learns of his condition. We kind of skipped that part in verse 6. And I, again, I, that's when I wish I knew the answers. How did he learn about, did he ask the guy about his condition? Did he ask other people? Had he heard about him? When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? What was this life, this guy's life like up to that point? False hope. False hope may be squeezed out of him till it dried up. That he had perhaps now been dealing with mental health issues. Depression. Maybe he'd gone past anxiety into resignation. That this is it. I'm going to lay here and other people are going to keep getting cured, but I can't get it. It's right there, and I will never get it. And Jesus says, do you want to get well? Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once he was cured, pick up his mat and walk. And I think, I think that's not a whole lot different than us living in sin. And getting used to it. And getting comfortable with it. Of us living in broken relationship with God. And starting to believe that's it. That's all that there is. I mean, we know, our theology says we can't hope ourselves out of it. We can't wish ourselves out of it. We can't want ourselves out of it. We can't work ourselves out of sin. But Jesus comes along and says, do you want to be better? Do you want to get out? Do you want to have your relationship stored? And we say, yeah, Lord, I've been trying. I've been praying. I've been working. I've been giving. But I just can't get there. That's not the questions he's asking. Do you want it? Have it. Salvation has already been given. The miracle has taken place. Do we listen to his voice when he says, get up. Walk in me. Live in me. Come to me. Restoration is here. You just have to get up. How many have chosen to say, oh, if only that were true. I wish it were that easy. If only I could believe that, but that's not how it works. This man could have been there for another 30 years, waiting to get in the water. 
But he trusted. And when Jesus said, get up, he got up. I don't know what God is speaking to you. I don't know what Jesus is telling you. But I know this. Trust him. Trust him. Don't argue. Don't try to outthink him. Get up and walk. I'd say walk like a man, but I think it would be better that you walk like a child. Walk like a child of the king, trusting him. Not needing to know what's around the next bend or where are we going, but trusting him. Get up and walk. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you. Thank you that we don't have to try to pick ourselves up by their own bootstraps. Thank you that we don't have to wait for somebody else to come and put us in the water. That you come to us and you call us to get up, to walk. Allow us to hear and trust Take your hand. As a child of faith, to walk. Thank you, Father, for what you do through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. Thank you, O Spirit, for how you speak truth into my life. That you speak truth through the shadow of what I believe to be real and how things get done. Oh Lord, allow me to not question, but to get up and walk. Hear, Lord, this our prayer together. Our hymn, if you're using one of our hymnals, hymn number 436, it's also included right there at the end of your worship packet, the solid rock. If you're comfortable standing, I invite you to do so. We'll sing together. 436, the solid rock. <laughs>
us today. I'm glad that we could gather to worship. I'm glad that we could hear God's word and perhaps hear an old, old story in a new way. And that it would impact who we are. That it will change what we do today and tomorrow. Again, thanks for being here. Uh, don't forget um, about Memorial Day coming up, not Monday, but next Monday. Uh, check for that email to see how you can participate. If you're here in the sanctuary and want to track down Anissa, she might have some ideas for you as well. I hope that we can gather again soon and worship together. Receive now the benediction. Now. Now. Go. Get up. Walk. In the name of Jesus. Go. Share the good news with others. Share with those who have been hearing the alarm and just can't get out. Share with them the hope in Jesus Christ who has already done it. Go in his name. Be a blessing to others. Be a blessing to him. And may you in turn be blessed. Amen.